If you have your Bibles, turn in them to the book of Revelation, chapter 3. We're going to be in verses 1 through 6. Revelation 3, 1 through 6. As you turn in there, we'll, um, we've been talking about these, these letters to the seven churches that are in there and addressing how Jesus is, is pointing out these spirits within the churches, that there really is a spiritual warfare. These, there's really principalities at work in our world. We know this, that there are certain things, whether we want to call it our, our, our culture um, or the kind of the environment that we're in, but we know that there are certain aspects of our world that drive us, that motivate us, that, that even kind of direct us to make the direct decisions that we make in our lives, even, even down to our culture. But there are real spiritual aspects as well, very real spiritual aspects to our world. And in the same way, there are very real spiritual aspects in our churches. And these letters are meant to address these spiritual aspects that the churches are, are going through. And they're meant, because there are seven churches, they're meant to represent us, just your everyday church, that we are a part of what is happening. And all of these things, to some capacity or another, affect every one of us. And so today we're going to talk about the letter to the church in Sardis, and the spirit that, that God sees there, that he speaks to there, and how that affects us. So if you would, if you have it, Revelation chapter 3, would you rise to your feet as we read the word of the Lord? Revelation 3, beginning in verse 1, the Word of God says, And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, These are the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have a name of being alive, but you're dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is on the point of death, for I have not found your works perfect in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard. Obey it and repent. If you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. Yet you will, still, you will have still a few persons in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes, and they will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. If you conquer, you will be clothed like them in white robes, and I will not blot your name out of the book of life. I will confess your name before my Father and before his angels. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. You may be seated. So to understand it again, each one of these, you have to understand the city, right? We talked about part of the problem with us reading the scripture is we don't know the context because most of us hear Sardis and we don't know anything about it. Like Sardis, I mean, where is that? I mean, how many of you actually know where Sardis is at? Right? Not a whole lot of people. And even if you put it on your Google Maps, it's going to take you a second to find it. Actually, it's not going to come up because it doesn't exist anymore. So we don't know a whole lot about it. But each of these cities that I've mentioned has a characteristic that the hearer or the reader would know. We would get it. And when John writes this, he expects us to understand that part of the city so that we can understand what he's saying. Otherwise, it's not going to make any more sense to us. Imagine, if you will, somebody who knows nothing about America. In fact, more specifically, they know nothing about America, and especially nothing about Texas, and especially nothing about this little fort in Texas and San Antonio that we call the Alamo. Right? So imagine someone's never heard of that place, and, and, and they're, they're, they're about to go to, to, let's say they're going to go to a sports game. They're, they're going to play a game against their team, and, and they're going to go out there, and they, they, they're, they're probably going to lose. And I tell them, hey, remember the Alamo. Like, what am I telling them? What am I saying by telling them, remember the Alamo? Well, for them to understand what I'm saying, they have to know the story of the Alamo, right? We all have heard the phrase, remember the Alamo. And most of us are like, well, yeah, but that's, um, that's this thing we remember when we're about to lose, but you keep going, right? You never give up. That's right. Because at the Alamo, what happened? Well, Davy Crockett and a bunch of people were out there to go fight off Santa Ana, and they lost. They absolutely lost at the Alamo, but they fought hard to the end, and that's why for us it's a big deal. So when we talk about the Alamo in our context, it makes sense. But if I said that to somebody who'd never heard of America, who'd never heard of the Alamo, let's say someone who, who time-traveled from the year before the Alamo happened, how much sense would it make to them? Well, nothing. And so for us today, even hearing about the church in Sardis, when we read this, if we don't know about the city of Sardis, this doesn't make any sense to us. And so what we do, what we, we do what we always do. We start to translate it anachronistically. We take it out of its time period, put it in ours, and we say, well... Let's, um, let's see what it means and just kind of break it down without understanding the context of the city. That's a really bad way of doing this. So I'm going to have to give you guys a real quick kind of lesson about Sardis. Sardis was a city that, um, 
had a lot of money and had a lot of good natural defenses. In fact, the way Sardis is built is it's got cliff sides almost all the way around it. And because there's cliff sides around the city, it's hard to attack this city. And so this city, it, it, it was 500, built about five, 600 years before Jesus. This city's put on this cliff and the people got these walls around it and they're proud. And they're going, look at us. We got this awesome city. Nobody can attack us because we got these cool cliffs right there and they'll just fall and die. And if they do, we'll just drop rocks on them or whatever, right? They can't get up here. We got a wonderful city. And so they get happy and they get, they get to feeling like they're perfectly secure where they're at. But what happened was, in uh, about 400 B.C., 400 years before Jesus, this city that thought they were perfectly fine, King Cyrus, who's going around, you guys remember um, the movie 300, right? This is Sparta, right? Like, I, I don't have the, the, I'd rip off the shirt if I had the abs, but I don't, right? Right, that movie, right? That was King Cyrus coming to attack them. He was the bad guy, right? The bald dude with the earrings, okay? So Cyrus, in real life, he was a real person. Cyrus goes, decides he wants this city. Man, I want that city. That city is just a wonderful city. How do we get it? So one of his soldiers goes over there, checks it out, looks at it, and watches it, and studies it for a while. And one day he's watching a soldier that's up on, on, the, on the wall of the city drop his helmet. And so the, the historian Herodias records this, so this is historically documented. He drops the helmet, and he watched the soldier come out and take a secret trail down the cliffside. The soldier's like, Cyrus. I know what we're going to do. And so they gather the army, and they go up the secret trail at night. And since they're so sure of their city being perfectly secure, nobody's watching the walls. They just come in at night, walk into the walls, open the gate, come in, take the city. And all of a sudden, Sardis becomes Cyrus. Cyrus owns Sardis, right? So they, they, they get caught in this. They get caught not paying attention. So the soldiers of Sardis were so confident in the natural defenses of their city, they felt no need to keep this diligent watch on it. And so the city was easily conquered. And when this happens, when something happens to us like this, when we, when we have our defenses down somewhere and someone finds a weak spot and they get us there, what's the first thing we do? We re-secure that weak spot, right? We're like, okay, well, here's where he got me. This is my weak spot. I'm going to fix it. And surely they did this in Sardis, but not for very long. Because they looked at it and said, look, no one's going to scale that again. It was a fluke. Nobody can get to us. So over the course of time, this overconfidence built back up. And in us, the same thing can happen. Over the course of time, we can become overly confident as we forget what the weak spot cost us. And the same thing happened to Sardis again 200 years later when Antiochus attacked and conquered this overconfident city that didn't set a watch. They had nobody guarding. They just walked in with the army and took the city. And so what happened was during the time that this was written, during the first century when people would read this, they knew about the city of Sardis. And the city of Sardis... And just like for us, the Alamo is known as the city that, that fights to the death. The city of Sardis was known as the city that's overly confident. So that's what they're known for. This is what the culture knew. Sardis, oh, that's them overly confident people that keep getting taken because they're overly confident. So when he writes to the church in Sardis, this is in their mind. In the same way, if God wrote a letter, he said, to all those who are at the church at the Alamo, right? Don't forget what it cost you. We would know what he's talking about. Okay, so we as a church can also find ourselves in this situation. We can find ourselves comfortable with our situation and let our guard down from attacks. We can become so overconfident in our position that we don't even bother to take steps to grow or to recognize needs. We can say, look, everything's working. My life is fine. And, and this, is, this is, unfortunately, the vast majority of people in America. My life's fine. I mean, I'm not rich, but, you know, it's fine. I got, I got a family, I got, you know, my kids are okay, you know, my, my job's, eh, um, the bills are mostly paid, things are good, everything's kind of just flowing along. And since my life is fine, I don't need church, I don't need change, I don't need anything more than what I've got. And, and to be fair, I've already got a full load, so why would I add this stuff to it anyway? Because even for those of us who are coasting in life, even for those of us who are like, yeah, you know, my life is fine, the reality is if your life is fine, you're probably investing all of your time trying to keep your life fine, right? I mean, it, it takes up your entire day, week, and month just to keep everything fine. And so we're okay with that. Why would I want to do more? And when we tend to fall back to this old saying, look, and if it isn't broke, why fix it? Again, I'm not rich, but you know what? I get by, I eat, everything's going to be okay. And we do this in the church as well. We say, look, if it's not broke, why fix it? Everything's working fine. We got people here. We're paying the bills. The building looks nice. The lawn's mowed. Um, we, we have a pastor. Everything's hunky-dory. Why do we need to change everything? Everything's fine. If it's not broke, why fix it? But the problem with that statement is it makes a couple of really bad assumptions that maybe we don't think about. 
The first assumption is that it's not broke. Because somehow in our minds, if everything's fine, it's not broke. Now, I remember having a truck that I thought was fine. But to start it, you had to, I, had to, I had the glow plugs rigged, so you had to push a button and hold it there. And then you had to turn the screwdriver to get it started and make sure that it was going right there. But it was fine. But it sure wasn't right. It needed to be fixed. And we do that in our lives in so many aspects and even in the church. We assume that it's not broke. And since the church isn't falling apart, since we're surviving, since we're not in a state of disaster, then surely it's working. And what we've done, even without saying it, we do this in our churches, we do this in our careers, we do this in our lives, we do this in our parenting, we do this in just about every single aspect. And what we do without saying it out loud is that we measure success by survival. If I'm surviving, I'm successful. If I survived parenting, I'm successful. If I survived life, I'm successful. If the church is surviving, it's successful. And that's what we've done is we've dropped this bar of success as, as this thing of surviving. But the purpose of the church is not to survive. The purpose of the church is to be the community that lives a cruciform life pattern, offering an alternative way of life to the world. We're supposed to be the people who live like Jesus so that the world goes, those ridiculous Christians, look at what they're doing. That's just stupid. Why are they living like that? And then when everything in their life falls apart, they go, I haven't tried that yet, though. So it offers an alternative life pattern that looks like Christ. That's what we're supposed to be doing. That's why Jesus was flipping everything that we knew upside down, teaching all these radical things like love your enemy, forgive those who hurt you, challenge the status quo, welcome the marginalized, level the playing field. This life pattern that the church is supposed to emulate becomes the ultimate testimony to the world. It's how they know that we follow Christ by the way we live. I remember the old adage, go out and share the gospel and if necessary, use words. We can go out and tell people about Jesus all day long. I can wear the shirt. I love Jesus and, and put a big old fish on the back of my car. But if I'm not living like Jesus, the testimony that I'm giving isn't the one I should be giving. I'd rather walk around with my nice Metallica shirt. Besides, I love me some good Metallica and talking about Jesus and being nice to people. Treating people the way Jesus did, actually helping people. There's a huge difference in that. That's the cruciform life that we're supposed to be living but we're not perfect. And this is the part that maybe we struggle with even in the church. We're not perfect. We have never reached that point in our lives. No single individual in here nor any church has reached that point where we've got it all figured out. That's why we pray for other churches. I love the Nazarene denomination. I do. I love this church. But it's not perfect. I know it's not perfect. I don't believe that any church is perfect. And so we, we pray for each other, recognizing that, 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 that Pastor Keith down at, at New Canaan Baptist, he's growing a church. He's growing himself. He's a wonderful human being. Pastor, Pastor Steve is growing. They're, they're growing a church. We're all growing because we're not perfect. And so we try to grow our churches. We try to move towards this, this state of perfection of being better. And so we're always in a state of growth. And if that's true, if we're always in a state of growth, which I think we would all agree on, then we should always be working on being more like Christ. It's crazy how many times we'll say, yeah, we all need to grow. Nobody's perfect. Well, let's work on being like Christ. Well, that seems like a waste of time. Really? Because we need to do that if we intend to grow that way, if we believe that to be true. Our actions will, 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 will dictate what it is that we truly believe. We've never achieved perfection to the point where we can sit back and just enjoy the ride. And that goes for anybody. There was never a time when we existed in such a state. We have never existed and never will exist, at least in this life, in a state where we can just sit back and enjoy the ride. I, I said a prayer once and um, got baptized and now I believe in Jesus. I can move on. I don't need anything else. That doesn't actually work that way. Or I don't need to go to church. I don't need to do this, um, whatever. It doesn't actually work that way. Or I can go to church, but I don't need to actually grow and participate and do anything so long as I show up and I tithe. It doesn't actually work that way. I'm not sure who told us this, but they lied to us. So whoever it is that's telling you this, next time you see them say, hey, look, I love you, but you're wrong. Because that's not what this book teaches at all. And it's not reality. It's not even logical. It's not even reasonable to think that way. Yet how many times do we, do we start to live as a people who say, look, where I'm at is fine. It's okay. Or it's not even maybe where I'm at, but you know what? It's not just where I'm at, but where I used to be was fine. If we could just get the church back to the good old days. If we just get the world back to the good old days, we can get back to those Ozzy and Harriet days. Some of y'all remember some Ozzy and Harriet? Some of you guys are like, who? They had, a, they had Ricky who had twins. Um, Nelson, nobody? Am I the only person who watched Ozzy and Harriet? <laughs> right? Okay. I love Lucy. You in big trouble, Lucy. Right? Come on. It's horrible. 
Right? And we, we look back and it goes, man, things were simple and they were wonderful. And Ozzy and Harriet, if you've never seen it, it's almost this perfect example of how everything is perfectly fine and wonderful. But the reality, it wasn't. Right? There was never a such thing as the good old days. There was never a time when everything was right. The good old days, when we say that, are a skewing of the reality of history. We've always had problems. We've always struggled. And it's not to say that those times were worse, but it's just to say that's reality. That's where we're at now. We need to stop looking back. Today is the day that the Lord has made. And when we look back, when we become a people that say, okay, well, this is how we used to be. Let's get there. Or we become a people that say, where I'm at is fine. I don't need to do anything. We start to develop an apathetic spirit. We have this spirit of, I don't care. I don't need to do anything. That's their problem. Let them do this. Because I've got this and I've got that. And this apathetic spirit, when it comes to church, when it comes to God, this apathetic spirit is one of the most common spirits that we see in our world today, especially in America. Look, I love America. I love this country. My dad came here because he believed that in America, anybody who worked hard could have a future. And he proved it. He worked hard here. And he did wonderful here in America. I love being born in America. I love the rights that I have in here. But man, this is a country of pretty lazy people anymore. Because we're like, eh, I don't care about that. Let them deal with it. That's their problem. And we live in our own compartments, and we think about us, and we brought that into the church, where the church is more like, I do my thing, you do your thing. I don't need to go there to do that, and you can't tell me I believe in Jesus or don't believe in Jesus. Like, why, why would we talk that way? Why do we have this mentality that, that of apathy saying, I don't care and I don't think anyone else should care either. It's nobody's business. This apathetic spirit causes us to be satisfied with doing the minimum and then maybe dressing it up. Like, I don't have to do a whole lot in the church. I can be satisfied with boiling down the gospel to attract. All you need to know is that Jesus died for your sins, and if you confess your sins and say a prayer, you're saved. Well, that is true. But that is a very small part of a huge gospel. And to assume that that's all you need to do is to say God's kind of lame because he needed 66 books to say it. Are you really going to believe that we're better than God? There's so much more to it than that. It's about life. It's about life now. And this, this apathetic spirit is to write it down, to, to, to boil it down to nothing, or, or even to make a ministry, nothing more than a set of fundraisers so we can write a check rather than actually engage in the needs of others. You know what I love about our missions? Is that, yes, we're going to have a fundraiser to raise funds because funds are important. But we're going to go on missions. We get involved with people. We go down to man and ministry. We, 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 we're going to the people's houses. We're doing things. We're there where people need us. We're providing for people. We, we open up the doors. A, a gentleman come by yesterday, just rang the doorbell, said, hey, do you have clothes? Yeah, we have clothes for you. Come on, let's hook you up with some clothes and some food. We're, we're missional now. We're actually engaging in the society, engaging in our community, engaging in the schools. We need to be a church that gets involved in all things. The task of the church is, is not to be in the maintenance. We're called to grow and to become a change agent for the world. But what happens, just like the city of Sardis, is we start to think, well, okay, everything's fine for me. I'm protected. The Lord's got us. We're doing great. I don't need to do anything. But when we do this, when we let our guard down, we get attacked. But we don't like to do these things if we're not being attacked. We are a world, and let's be honest, most of us, most of us are responsive rather than preventative, right? I don't worry about my car until it breaks down. I don't worry about my health until I end up in the hospital. We're responsive, not preventative. And we do the same thing in our churches. We're responsive rather than preventative. I'll worry about it. We'll worry about money when we run out of money. We'll worry about people when we run out of people. We'll worry about the paint when it starts to chip. And we'll worry about actually doing the work of Christ when we feel like we're not doing the work of Christ. And we become responsive rather than preventative. But to be preventative, to be in action, to do these things that he calls us to, it requires us to take risks. And this is where we really struggle, because we don't like risks. Because risks are an investment of ourselves with the possibility of loss. I don't like the risk of going to a church, because they might burn me. You know what kept me out of the church for the longest part of my life? My first 30 years, I hated church. I was going to church, having people burn me at church. thinking, man, you guys are a bunch of hypocrites. I can't stand this. I don't want nothing to do with this. And so going back to church for me, for my wife, for Trina, it was a risk for us because both of us hated Christians. Both of us hated church. We didn't want anything to do with that. We liked this God guy. Jesus seemed nice. But boy, your followers are a bunch of jerks. That's what we thought. And so it was a risk for us to go back to church. 
It's a risk for us to invest in people. I mean, we see people on the side of the road and sometimes we want to give them money and you're like, I don't know if I should give you money because I don't know if you really need it or if it's a scam, right? You see people, you know, put, putting the, the sign up for we need money for a funeral and you're like, I don't know if it's real. I don't know if it's a scam. We're afraid of risk because we're afraid to invest something with the possibility of loss. And so we, we, we do this at so many levels and we end up bringing that so much that it affects even the way we love and treat each other as a community, as people, as a church. Because to be fair, and every person who's ever been in a relationship knows this to be true, but loving someone, which is the essence of what we as the church are supposed to do, comes with inherent risks, doesn't it? And you want to love someone, you can and you will get hurt. You will find yourself questioning, why did I trust that person? You will find yourself questioning yourself, why did I give my heart to that person? Why did I do this? Your kids might hurt you. My kids might hurt me. I mean, I love my children, but the reality is they may hurt me one day. Kyle hurts me all the time when he thinks Star Wars is more important than Star Trek. But you know what? I love him anyway. No, but the truth is, look, they, they may, right? And we know this. If you have children who, who dealt with, you know, I watched my mom, how much all of us hurt my mom. All of us went through addictions, every one of her kids. And in hindsight, I look at how it took a toll on my mom, and I'm like, man, she loved us, and we hurt her by stealing from her, by, by lying to her. My wife might hurt me. My congregation might hurt me. I love you guys, but you're going to hurt me. I know you are. My neighbor might hurt me. The foreigner might hurt me. And yet God tells us that we're still to love them and to invest in them. And here's the things. I know my kids might hurt me. And because of how much I love them, they, they and then my wife, they have the ability to hurt me more than anybody else in this world. And yet I'm still willing to invest everything in them, take the risk because it's worth it. See, and that's what we have to do as a church. That if we're called to love the Lord with all our God, heart, mind, soul, and strength and love our neighbor as ourself, and he means it when he says that. That means that we take risks, that we do love this community and they may hurt us. We do love our neighbor and they may hurt us. We do love even our family here in the church even though they may hurt us. Because a truly Christ-like ministry, a truly Christ-like church will take risks even knowing that we're probably going to get hurt at some point. And so it requires taking a risk, but it also requires a divine imagination. We need to rethink how, how, how we live. We need to rethink how we worship. We need to rethink how we engage in ministry all of the time. We've got to never be a people that say, well, here's the church. This is how we do it. It looks like this. we got the pews. We do four gospel songs. We do a couple, of, a couple of scriptures. Pastor comes up. He preaches 20 to 25 minutes. That's all. And then we, um, we get done and we get out and we're in time to get over to, to wherever it is that we're going to go eat. So, so, right, we have this thing and this is what it looks like. And we only do it this way. And everybody likes it a certain way. And this is how church should look. And we refuse to change things and that's all of us we hate change listen to me i still think windows 94 was fine i don't know why we've changed from there i miss minesweeper and and solitaire and free cell y'all miss free cell some of you miss free cell that's how old you are and minesweeper right we don't like things to change and especially in our church because really our churches are so personal for us our churches are where we baptize our babies. Our churches are where we, we marry our children. Our churches are where we bury our siblings and, and our parents. Our churches are so intimately close to us and we have so much tied into it because we pour ourselves into our churches. And so we don't like the change, but the reality is it's not about you. It's about the ministry, which means we need to change it. We need to be willing to do that. We need to always be thinking, what's a better way to do this? Let's reimagine worship. Let's do it different. Let's look different. Let's, let's sing different. Let's baptize different. I'm, I was just kidding. I'm not going to hold you down to the bubbles disappear but we want to do things differently right we want to be differently because look what we've been doing hasn't been working it hasn't it has never worked and that's okay it's part of living in a broken world ours isn't to nail it and to get it perfect but ours is to say what do we tweak now how do we change it a little bit better how can we do this how can we do that how can we reimagine helping people how can we reimagine lifting people up how can we reimagine being christ in the world and we have to not be afraid of that divine imagination because the enemy, listen, the enemy is imaginative. 
The scripture tells us that the serpent was more shrewd than any creature. And because of that, we need to engage in a divine imagination that stays a step ahead and moves us towards Christ's likeness. Because if we're not constantly reimagining and wondering and checking and evaluating, the enemy is going to scale the walls and catch us with, with our guard down. We cannot be afraid of new things, or we will, in fear, become an apathetic church whose weakness will eventually cause us to be conquered, or worse, worse, to not even be considered a threat. Divine imagination is scary, and there's often such a pushback, because again, we don't like things to change. But growing in the image of Christ requires that we constantly reimagine what it looks like or how, how that acts in our world. But for the most part, what does hold us back is fear. We're afraid to fail. We're afraid to look foolish. Because look, when I sobered up, I, I, it bothered me more than anything at how many of my, my loyal friends and family were the most critical of me getting sober. Because we don't, we don't like to see other people do better. We, we criticize them. Oh, you're not drinking now, huh? You're too good. You're one of those. Whatever, man. See you in a week. Or, hey, we're going to, oh, yeah, I guess you don't drink now. You're too good for that. No, I just hate killing myself. I don't want to die, and I'm not sure why you're so obsessed with me killing myself. Because that's what it comes down to. Oh, now you go to church. Now you're one of those. Yeah, I want to actually follow up with what it is that I profess to believe. I want to be real. Why do you have a problem with me being real? That's what it comes down to. So we're afraid to look foolish in front of people. So we don't like to try new things. We don't want to try something I fail. I didn't know if church was going to work. Here's what I knew. I was a drug addict and an alcoholic and I was going to die. And what I was doing was not working. I tried everything else except church. In fact, I went out of my way to try everything but church because I hated church. But it was the only thing that worked. So I took a swing at it. And you know what happened? I'm still sober. I'm still alive. I still got a family and I'm still here. Because we cannot be afraid to look foolish. And we're afraid of losing more than we invested. I don't want to lose more than I put in. None of us do. What if I give up more of the freedoms than I'm going to get out of Christ? You're not going to. That's the enemy lying to you. That's foolishness. I still get bothered when people tell me, oh, well, you know, it's, it's good to have a few drinks here and there. It's kind of good for you. Man, I was a professional alcoholic. You are not going to lie to me about that. That's, that's, that's what we call in the theological world crap. Okay, that's what that is. It's a lie. It's just stupid. But we engage in this talk with each other. Because we're afraid of losing more than we invested. You're not going to lose more than what you invest if you participate with God, if you risk with God, if you engage in this divine imagination. And when we're, sometimes we're afraid, well, I can't keep up with the new direction. And that's fair. I get it. I, I, used, to, I used to laugh at my mom because, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm a Gen Xer. And so, like, we had all the cool technology. And I'm like, Mom, you don't even know how to work a walk, man. That's so lame. Like, we got CDs now. This is an anti-skip device, right? Things changed. I thought they were changing fast. And then I got kids, and, like, every day I'm out of the loop. Like, I'm like, I'm on Facebook, and my kids are like, you're such a boomer. No, I'm not. I'm a Gen Xer. What? What? They're, they're like, you got to be on the ticky talkie or whatever. Right? All this. I'm like, What? They, they don't do that one, by the way. Oh, my goodness. Right? But, but the, the point is that things change so fast that even I'm starting to feel like I can't keep up with the new direction of stuff. I mean, I have my 13-year-old running our, our audio video back there because I don't know. I know how to get Minesweeper, and they don't even have that on there. That's what, what happened. But we do get afraid of trying new things, and I've seen it, but we can't be afraid that we're not going to keep up with this new direction. We're afraid that change is going to take us in the wrong direction. I'm a pastor. I'm afraid of that all the time. I always want change. I'm, I'm always thinking about new things to do. I just, my mind doesn't stop. So I'm like, let's try this. Let's try that. But I, I'm glad that I have a wonderful board and a wonderful council that will come out and say, you know, maybe that's not the best direction. Why? Well, because that direction is actually going to take us over there. Oh, oh, yeah, that's right. So sometimes we're afraid of the wrong direction, but you know what? At least you're trying something. We're afraid, and, and, and too often we're afraid, we're afraid of just doing anything, and so we just coast along. And we coast along out of fear. But, but here's the thing, if you're coasting, you always coast away from God. You always coast away from growth. You always coast away from life and from thriving and from all the wonderful things that God wants you to have in this world. So if you want to coast through life, you do it, but you are not going to live life to the fullest. You are going to have wasted 
this opportunity that God gives you. We need to get away from this apathetic spirit, but that requires that we are free from fear. And the scripture teaches that perfect love casts out fear. And it's okay to take a swing. I tell, I tell all my leaders and my, board, and my board members, I want you guys to try new things. I, I literally told them, I, I expect you, part of the way I'm going to decide whether you're, you're, you're working hard at this is if you're failing good. If you don't have at least one huge failure a year where you come and you're like, Pastor, you're going to fire me. Then I don't think you're trying hard enough. I want you to fail. I want you to swing so big because you can't go yard unless you swing big. And if you swing big, you're going to whiff once in a while. And that's okay. Because here's the thing. Success was never dependent upon us. It's dependent upon God. Ours is simply to take the swing as God directs. So we can't have this apathetic spirit that keeps us back. Ours is simply to love God and let that love manifest into this crazy, relentless, consuming love for other people. Ours is respond to that love of God and that, that he pours out upon us and, and that brings us true hope and true peace. And there's so many ways that we can do this in a church today. Oh, I'm excited about today. Today, we're going to see this through baptisms. That's awesome, right? The, the, the baptism is it's an open response to what God is calling us to. Baptism is a sacramental example of what it is that we're supposed to be doing as a church. Each one of us is supposed to be engaging in these activities that God calls us to. I love this brother Michael Skipper one day said, Pastor, I'll get baptized. I'm like, the Lord has led you to do something. We're going to do it. We're going to stop everything and we're going to do this because God called you to this amazing thing. And it was bold and brave to come up and say, I feel like I'm led to do this. Each one of us is supposed to do what God says as a witness to others. And what we're going to see today is a witness to you. It's a testimony to you. It's a testimony to all those who would see it of the work that God is doing. And when we do this, something else is going to happen. Listen, and this is the part we need to really be aware of. Once we do this, when we start to do the work that God calls us to do, when we take risks, when we use a divine imagination, when we answer what it is that God calls us to do, the enemy is going to become threatened. And too often, the apathetic church assumes that since nothing bad's happening to us, well, then we're doing all right. I'm doing fine because nothing bad's happening to us. And nothing's bad's happening to us because surely God's protecting us. But here's the thing. Too many Christian churches today are so apathetic that the enemy has no reason to attack them. And that's the reality. Everything's going fine because you're not a threat to anybody. And so we need to ask ourselves, is our church serving God in such a way that the Satan is threatened. Because if not, the good news is he's not going to attack us. He doesn't care. There's no sense in it. In fact, if we're not being attacked by the enemy, there's a pretty good chance it's because the enemy doesn't consider us a threat. That might give us something to consider. Now, the enemy is certainly attacking us. I see so many ways, and I hate it, and I pray against it. But, but I want all of us, because I know that there are people here who are even struggling, feeling like the enemy's been attacking me, the enemy's attacking me, doing this. Listen, the enemy attacking you, that's a good sign. That means that you're there with Jesus. The enemy isn't attacking you. The enemy's attacking Jesus. You just happen to be so close to Jesus that you're getting hit with stuff that's meant for him. That puts you in a great place. And so he tells this church, wake up. He says, we need, to, we need to wake up from our slumber. We need to have someone light a fire up underneath us. We need to be motivated to get out of bed. We've got to start moving to make things happen. We need to quit making excuses for not engaging in the work that God has called us to. And we need to realize that the stakes matter. We need to look around us, wake up, and see that normal is not working. And he tells them, strengthen what remains. We need to look to our resources and strengthen them in regard to, to, to everything that we have. We need to encourage each other. We need to build each other up, not tear each other down. We need to be encouraged by the baptisms that we're going we're gonna to witness today. We're encouraged by the testimonies that we hear where we're strengthened through our fellowship. We're strengthened through the communal worship. We're, we're strengthened when we pray for each other. We're strengthened when we ask our church to pray for us. And that's a hard one for us. I'll pray for you, but I'm not going to ask you to pray for me. You need to ask your church to pray for you. There's strength in that. Let me tell you something. It's not foolishness to ask for help. That's wisdom. And we're strengthened when we risk everything out of a genuine love for God and for others. And I would risk everything for my wife and for my kids. I would risk for this church. I would risk for our community. 
And then God says, remember the things that he's done. Remember then what you received and heard and obey it. Remember what we were told at first, and we need to get back to the core of who we are. Jesus called us, and he said that we're to go and make disciples of the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. This is what we're called to do. We're called to simply go out and make disciples of the nations. We're not commanded to have potlucks or anything like that. Now, those, those are wonderful, and they're a great means to the end, but they are not the end itself, and they're not the method by which we should be judging how good we're doing. We can't be judging ourselves by not being attacked. We can't be judging ourselves by simply how wonderful the potlucks are, or how great the attendance is, or financially how well we're doing. That's not how we judge ourselves. The transformation of people from death to life is the only sign of success and health in this ministry. That's what we look to. And then finally, he says, repent. We need to give up this apathetic spirit in exchange for a spirit of conviction. We need a church on fire, a church of people who are convicted to do the work that calls us to. Not a people who say, well, I'm just going to hang back and watch, but a people who are saying, where do I step in? What are you calling me to? That we would stand up with the prophet and say, here am I, send me. We have to give this up. We cannot be the church of Christ if we are not 100% convicted of the gospel message. And I get it. There are many of us who are willing to be like the Jesus of the resurrection. We love that. We love the Jesus that brings us life, the Jesus that conquered death. But friends, not enough, of enough, not enough of us are willing to get there through the crucifixion. And that's what we need to do. Not enough Christians are willing to be crucified with Christ. We're just willing to take, a, take up his life or his, his, his promise of life. The church needs to wake up. Friends, we need to take chances. We need to live. We need to thrive. So I pray that we would do that here. I pray that we would become a people who says, Father, use us to do greater things. Light us up to praise you with everything that we are. Let us be your people. Let this world, let this community know, if nothing else, them people down at Mercy Springs are crazy in love with Jesus. And they do crazy things that look like Jesus. Because if that's all we would do, I promise you this, you would find great joy in your life and you would become a great joy to the world around you. I, I want to... I want to ask our baptismal candidate to stand up. We're going to witness four people who are going to do this today. Yeah, all right? Turn around, guys. Turn around. Turn around so take a seat. Michael Finland, Aiden Rangel, Shinoa Solis, and Karis Comerick. I'm excited. Come on. So before we start on this, look, baptism is an awesome thing. So when we baptize and we do this, um, uh, family, friends, whatever, Feel free to come up, take the pictures, do whatever you want to do as we're doing that, okay? Because I'm like my wife is the picture, picture person, so I always have to say that go ahead and come up and take pictures as needed, and there are probably going to be other people taking pictures as well. So, so we know Christian baptism is a sacrament signifying participation by faith in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and incorporation into his body, the church. It's a means of grace proclaiming Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. The Apostle Paul declares that all who are baptized into Christ Jesus are baptized into his death. We're buried with him through baptism so that just as Christ was raised from the dead, we too are raised to walk in newness of life. As we've been united with him in his death, we're also reunited with him in his resurrection. And so, Michael, Aiden, Shinoa, Chris, the, the, the Christian faith into which now you are coming to be baptized is affirmed in the Apostles' Creed, which we confess. So here's what I want us to do. Um, we're all going to read the Apostles' Creed together. Would you rise to your feet real quick? Let's read this. Let's read the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, in the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and of the life everlasting. Amen. 
So to the four of you, I ask, will you be baptized into this faith? Yeah. Amen. You may be seated. So what I'm going to do then is I'm going to invite them up one at a time. I'll call you up here. And um, what you'll do is you'll, you'll walk up here. You'll come up and I'll take your hand and we'll bring you into the baptismal. And I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. I told you there was going to be a test. And um, then I'm going to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit as the scriptures command us to do. And I'm really excited because this is such an amazing aspect. It is the, the baptizing into the family of God. That this baptism isn't into the Nazarene church. It's not into the Mercy Springs church. It's into the Christian church universal. You're baptized into God's grand church. And it's an amazing, wonderful experience and, and, and event that God calls us to. So I invite Michael. Would you come up first, please, brother? Oh. Come on up, brother. Watch your step. Don't fall. No, I'll try not to. Yeah. The insurance is paid, right? I don't know. Hopefully. <laughs> okay, turn around. Um, put your hand on your face, your nose. Man, you are. <laughs> All right. Michael. Yes. Do you acknowledge Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and do you believe that he saves you even now? Yes. And as a member of the church of Jesus Christ, will you follow him all the days of your life, growing in grace and the love of God and of neighbor? Yes. Then, Michael, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Come on. Come on up. Here, here's a towel for you. That was awesome. Come on. We, we need like a splash zone. Aiden. Come on up here, little man. Do not belly flop. It's not cold. It's not cold. Those ice cubes are still in there. Just kidding. Oh, Aiden, you better look at your mom for a picture. Okay. Aiden, do you profess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and do you know that he saves you even now? Yes. Awesome. And as a member of the church of Jesus Christ, will you follow him all the days of your life, growing up in grace and the love of God and neighbor? Yes. Okay, put your hand on your nose. Put your hand right here. And Aiden, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. All right? Mom, Grandma's got your towel. All right. Shino and Chris, do you guys want to come up together? Yeah. All right, come on up. Who's first? Are you first, Chris? Come on in. Uh, okay, I'm Let me have your towel. Okay, we'll set that right here, sweetie. Give me a hand. Okay, be careful coming in. Don't slip. Watch out for that shark. <laughs> I just want to sing the song now. Oh. Baby shark, dun, 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 baby. Now all you guys got in your head all day and you're going to be mad at Pastor. Oh. Got your nose right there. Okay, and then grab my wrist. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> do you, Carice, do you profess Jesus as your Lord and Savior and do you know that he saves you even now? Yes. And as a member of the church, will you diligently give your life to Christ, to the love of neighbor and to God? And Carice, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. You okay? Hold on, hold on. You okay? okay. Yeah, you're okay. There you go, sweetie. Take your time. Take your time. Come on, slow. You're all right. That was awesome. Noah, do you profess Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, and do you know that he saves you even now? Yes. 
And as a member of the church, will you give your life to diligently serve Christ and the church and to love God and your neighbor? Yes. Take your hand and cover your nose. Take this hand and cover your nose. <laughs> Grab my wrist. Okay. As you know, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Oh. God is so amazing, isn't he? Amen. The baptism reminds us that God does this real thing in our world, and, and I get it. It's hard to comprehend because there's a spiritual aspect, and, and we're, we are people of the flesh. We're the people of the physical, and so God, by his grace, allows us to use these elements, these things we call the accidents, the bread, the water, too to express and to experience a real work that God does in us. And so the baptism does represent our faith in God. It's an outward expression of this inward work. But the work that God does literally within us is literal. It is a real work, a sealing of the Holy Spirit into the church. And it's a wonderful, monumentous, and important moment in our life. So Father, I pray that as we continue to worship you as this, Michael, Shanoa, Carice, and Aiden, Father, continue to grow in you. That your spirit would sanctify them entirely. That they would continue to be just living examples and expressions of your love into this world. I see the newness in so many of them, Father. I think especially of Aiden being here since the first day I got here, watching him grow with, with my own kids. And I see this work that you are doing that I who once lived in death can experience this life and I give you praise. And I pray that so many of us would recognize that, that you are the God of the living. That you want what is right for us, you want what is good for us and you call to each one of us, every one of us. You invite us, Father, to, to sit at the table with you. You invite us to, to bask in the glory that you pour out into this world. You invite us to be a part, a participant your heavenly work even now and we give you praise so I pray Lord that we would praise you I want to invite the rest of the team to come up I want to ask you to stand on your feet and I want to bless each one of you so if you take your hands and you just hold them out as if you're receiving a blessing may the Lord bless you and keep you May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you. May the Lord give you peace.